Okay, so recently I had to place a bet, and at stake were not 100 euros or 1,000 euros, but at stake was my professional career. Now, to give you some background, I recently finished my PhD in the field of quantum computing, and I was confronted with the question, should I bet on the success of quantum technologies and devote my professional career to that subject? Or, in other words, should I believe in the words of the, well, let us call it a quantum hype, and view the quantum journey as a sprint, where we'll have broad advantage in the next few years to so just months, only the fastest participants will benefit, and you have to jump on a train right now? Or should I believe the pessimists who view quantum at that end, a nice academic exercise that is doomed to be useless in real-world settings? Well, being confronted with this question, what was the natural next step for me to do as a researcher? Well, I conducted research on the topic, and I found that it is not only of my personal interest, but it is of raising public and private interest of businesses, investors, and whole nations. So there was already a relevant body of knowledge available that helped me answer my question. And in this talk, I want to share few the main findings of my research, flavored with my personal view on the topic, how I see the future of quantum technologies. So it's quantum technologies, sprint, or dead end, to quantum or not to quantum, that is the question that I will address. But at first, we have to understand what do I mean with quantum technologies? Well, specifically, I'm talking about quantum information technologies. So technologies that harness quantum mechanical effects, so quantum mechanics is the theory that describes the behavior of a very small particles, and uses these effects specifically for the purpose of information manipulation. And for any kind of information technology, we have a quantum pendant. So for information input, we have quantum sensors. For information processing, we have quantum computers. And for information transfer and security, we have quantum communication and cryptography. Now the question is, why now? Why didn't we hear of quantum computing, for example, in the 1980s? I mean, the theory of quantum mechanics is already 100 years old. Well, the reason is that it is incredibly hard to preserve the quantum mechanical character of a physical system. And only recently, we have the technological means available that allow us to build devices that can handle this extreme fragility. And this makes us the first generation that is able to manipulate nature at its core quantum mechanical level on purpose. And it's also the reason for the current hype around quantum. It's not because these initial devices already outperform their classical counterparts, but it's because there's a hope that there will be a positive feedback loop. Where you have these initial devices, this increases the interest, more research is conducted, more money flows into the field, this speeds up the development time, better devices are built, again, more money, more research, and so on and so forth, you get it. So all these technologies harness quantum mechanical effects, but they come with different promises, different challenges, and also different maturity levels. So it's worth looking at them individually. And the first technology that I want to address is quantum computing because it's probably the most prominent one, and it's also convenient to introduce you to some concepts of quantum mechanics. And please, for now, just accept this as rules. No one can expect to understand now quantum mechanics in four minutes. Uh, even a physics novel laureate, Richard Feynman, once said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. So even for physicists, it's a rather counterintuitive field, and the vast majority, quote, just shuts up and calculates. So that's another one from Richard Feynman. Anyways, I want to introduce you to four principles. First is superposition, second, measurement, third, interference, and fourth, entanglement. And I'll make use of the analogy of a coin toss to explain you these principles. And now, my apologies and a warning to all physicists watching, heavy simplifications incoming. Okay, first principle, superposition. This refers to the fact that a quantum mechanical system cannot or can be in several states at the same time. So, using our coin analogy, it's not either heads up or tails up, but it can be kind of some, kind of both at the same time. So you can think of it a little bit like, you know, the situation where it still spins in the air and it's not decided yet whether it will be heads up or tails up in the end. The next principle is the measurement. So, after each and every quantum computation, what we have to do in the end is to conduct a measurement, to read information from the device. And what happens during the measurement is, from a superposition of states, from the various states that you had represented in the system before, only a single state survives. So in our coin toss example, you will end up with heads up or tails up in the end. Third principle is interference. Now, when you do a measurement, the state that you get from a superposition is actually random. But there are certain probabilities associated with the respective states. 
And in a coin toss, these probabilities are obviously 50-50 for heads up and tails up. But in quantum computing, we can play around with the probabilities. And we can increase the probabilities for the states that we want and decrease the probabilities for the states we, that we do not want. And that is referred to as interference. And with these three first principles, we already can understand one of the main rationales behind using a quantum computer. So it's representing all of the possible solutions of your problem at once, superposition. Then you increase the probability for the states that you want, interference. And then you measure the solution to your problem with a high probability. But to really gain power of quantum computing, we need a fourth principle. We need entanglement. And Einstein called this also a spooky interaction at a distance. And to explain your entanglement, consider now the case of having two coins, both of them in a superposition state. Now, when you measure the first coin, you get either heads up and tails up, or, or tails up. And if these two coins are entangled immediately, immediately also the state of the second coin gets determined. You don't have to measure it, but you know it because these two coins are highly correlated. And this also was true if you would place the coins at different places of the universe. And this really puzzled Einstein. Why? Because if I measure the first coin at one place of the universe, immediately also the state of the other coin gets determined. And this seems to contradict his theory of relativity, which forbids information to travel faster than with the speed of light. So, well, in the meantime, scientists have relaxed the situation and found a solution to the problem. But nevertheless, it nicely shows how counterintuitive the field is, even to giants like Albert Einstein. So by harnessing these four principles, one can utilize what is called e exponentially growing search spaces in your information processing. Sounds nice, but what do we mean with that? Well, consider you have a quantum computer and you want to double its computational power. Well, all you have to do is to increase its size by one unit, which is typically measured in terms of qubits. And if you think of it, if you have a classical computer and you want to double its computational power, you have to double its size. But in a quantum computer, you just have to add one qubit. Or put another way, if two qubits would hold the same information as 500 classical bits, you add one qubit, you have three qubits, the information for the classical bits it would double to 1,000 classical bits. You add another qubit, you have four qubits, classical bits double again to 2,000 classical bits, and so on and so forth, until in our example, if you had 280 entangled qubits, they could hold more information in terms of classical bits than there are atoms in the universe. I mean, that's just an incredible number. It's a one with 90 zeros in the end. I mean, for us, unimaginable. But anyways, that sounds all really you know, nice, and it's really fascinating, but where is the practical point? How does this now translate into real-world advantages? Well, scientists found out that by harnessing this exponential advantage, you can gain tremendous benefits in terms of computational speed up for a plethora of applications, ranging from drug discovery to battery research to logistics optimization and so on and so forth. So, for example, in drug discovery or battery research, what you do is you, you use your quantum computer to simulate the behavior of your drug molecule or your battery material. So you use a quantum system, the quantum computer, to simulate another quantum system, the molecule or the material. In logistics optimization, you could use a quantum computer, for example, to find the route of a whole fleet of ships and trucks that comes with the lowest resource consumption, really, and so on and so forth. That's by far not the end. The point is, quantum computing does not outperform classical computing in any of these applications today. But we are here at the beginning of a very exciting journey, and there are for sure a lot of applications which are only solvable with a quantum computer, but we are not even aware of them today. Okay, so far I played the good cop for quantum computing. Time for the bad cop. Now, as a matter of fact, in quantum computing, we are still at the very beginning. And, for example, it's, it's really hard to preserve this quantum mechanical character. Every tiny perturbation from the environment introduces noise, introduces errors, and so you have to shield your devices from those perturbations. That's the first point. It's also not completely clear how to build these devices in a scalable manner, up to millions or billions of qubits. And there are also theoretical limitations, which make the algorithm design a very delicate task. So, for example, it's true that you can do your quantum computation efficiently, but getting information into your quantum device and getting information out of the quantum device, these are two real bottlenecks. And you already understand now the output bottleneck, because the output of your quantum computation is actually a certain superposition of states. Okay. What can you do now to read the information? All you can do is to conduct a measurement 
what happens during the measurement, you destroy your superposition. You get only a single state randomly. So you only get a glimpse on the actual computational outcome. So you have to repeat the process again and again until you have extracted enough information. That's the output bottleneck. So actually, this leaves us within a situation where, yes, there are great benefits at the horizon, but there are also a lot of challenges to overcome. And later, at this point, I realized, well, maybe I shouldn't view the quantum journey as sprint or a dead end. Maybe there's a third option. Maybe I should view it more a marathon, a long-term endeavor to reach the final goal of quantum advantage. Now, quantum computing is, yes, maybe the most prominent quantum technology, but it's also the one with the lowest maturity level because it is so hard to preserve the quantum mechanical character. And in the past, scientists asked the question, can we actually turn this bug of quantum computing into a feature? Can we make somehow use of this extreme fragility and sensitivity of quantum systems? And that was the birth of the field of quantum sensing. Now, what the quantum sensor allows you to do is to detect physical quantities like electric fields or magnetic fields with utmost sensitivity and accuracy. And again, this opens a plethora of applications where you can either co uh, improve compared to a classical sensor and an existing application, or you enable completely new applications based on these ex extended features of your quantum device. And examples for these applications range from navigation, where you can complement for GPS-based navigation, to biomedical imaging, where you can study brain activity or metabolism processes with highest levels of details. So we have these very accurate quantum sensors, we have these powerful quantum computers, but the technology with the highest maturity levels can actually be found in quantum communication and cryptography. For example, if you harness quantum mechanical effects, what you can do is you can establish a communication channel between two parties for exchanging a common key for data encryption and decryption. And this channel that you've built is theoretically proven to be secure. That is referred to as quantum key distribution. As an alternative to that, the main agencies for cybersecurity, like the American NIST, for example, they suggest to use so-called post-quantum cryptography already today. Why is that? It's because one of the most disruptive applications of future quantum computers is to break today's encryption methods. And they can be found really all over the place. I mean, from bank transfers to securing stored data. The point is, post-quantum cryptography, if you think of the term, it's not about directly harnessing quantum mechanical effects, but it is about classical means of cryptography that should be secure against attacks from these future quantum computers. OK, now you may ask, why should I bother today about post-quantum cryptography? The, qu the necessary quantum computers lie in the unknown distant future. I don't care. Well, there is the strategy to steal the data today and decrypt it once these uh, devices are available. And the big players in the field have noticed this threat and the need for post-quantum cryptography. And that's the reason why these technologies, these quantum secure algorithms, are being implemented in industrial settings today. Now, to summarize, we have heard about what quantum technologies are, which principles they harness, and which technologies are currently under development. How does all this answer my initial question? Should I view the quantum journey as a sprint at that end or a marathon? Well, I personally found, for me, it's not a sprint or a dead end, but it's also not a marathon. I actually view it as an enjoyable mountain hike where you have some distance peak hanging there in the clouds, but you don't know exactly how to get there. And whatever surprises and challenges and hurdles that may appear, the whole journey bears fruits already along the way. And because we have the technological means available today, and because there are great benefits at the horizon, we should boldly go and explore. But we shouldn't forget about the dangers of the quantum hike. We apply safety measures and backup plans in case things evolve in an unpleasant manner. That's my message, and I'm eager to see what the future will look like for quantum. Thank you.